Great. Uh, good afternoon, Simon, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, again, it, it feels weird uh, talking to my computer. Um, and, you know, I, I generally tend to feed off the uh, the energy of the room. And, you know, if somebody is nodding, I look at that person for most of the presentation. So this is a bit weird. That's why I put a smiling lady on, on my picture. So just to give me some some support during the presentation. But um, I'm looking forward to um, this afternoon's presentation and talking about um, these broad-based VE shares. I just need to, ah, okay, there we go. That's the, the button. So I just wanna kind of take you through the agenda for this afternoon. Um, we're gonna just talk briefly about GMI, who we are, what we do. And then I want to talk about and hopefully give the audience a bit of a conceptual understanding of broad-based VE shares. In my um, conversation with, with various people, and I'm sure there are several of you on, uh, on the webinar tonight, um, I kind of get a sense that the people's understanding and the way they, they tend to look at the issues um, you know, that understanding is not, is not quite there. They, they would sometimes look at things like the P ratios and, you know, dividend yields that sometimes important, but not, not the key issues there. Um, then I'm gonna look at some important concepts, market concepts, general investment concepts that would be applicable in the broad-based PE share space. And then I wanna look at the different opportunities, I think, that's what most people are here for, is to, to see what investment opportunities are there. So a brief introduction of GM Investments. We're a, a diversified investment advisory and wealth management company. Um, so BE shares, you know, we do that largely as an education thing, but we also include it and incorporate them in, in people's financial planning, uh, because ultimately these investments are made within a financial planning, investment planning, or retirement planning context. So it's not something that you can look at in isolation. We offer professional financial planning services to individuals, groups, and corporates. And yeah, we've grown since we launched in the middle of the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, we've grown to over 1,500 individual and corporate clients. Um, and currently manage about 1.6 billion of, of client money. Just some accolades that we've won along the way. Um, <clears throat> those of you familiar with the IntelliDex Awards, the top wealth manager and uh, private bank survey, there we, we won that award in, in 2018 on our third attempt or entry into that uh, survey. We also won Top Wealth Manager for Lump Sum Investors, Top Wealth Manager for Young Professionals. And three of the six years that we've entered, we won People's Choice as Top Wealth Manager, where our clients have rated their satisfaction in terms of service and the advice. In 2020, we, we ranked second as the Top Boutique Manager. You know, they changed the format in 2019. Um, so, yeah, we went from winning some awards to not qualifying uh, a year later. We also approved as a professional practice by the Financial Planning Institute. Uh, so we're currently one of 14 practices um, and the only black owned practice in the country to have that uh, accreditation. And also we've got the MASTED um, phase compliance stamp. Essentially MASTED are our compliance auditors. And um, yeah, to get the stamp, you need to get a minimum of 85% for every audit that they do on you in, in any one year. We get audited four times a year. So we, we're quite proud of that achievement that, you know, we're, we're running our practice within the requirements of the codes. And the most recent private bank and wealth manager survey, these were all the categories we could enter. And we ranked first for top financial advisor, second for the different investor archetypes. So lump sum investors, young professionals, entrepreneurs, wealthy executives, we rank second. We rank second as a top wealth 
tick and people's choice became third. So that was our, our most recent performance in, in that survey. And very quickly, our individual services, it, it's wealth creation and wealth protection. So fairly, like I said, a comprehensive service offering. So under investment management, you will see there the public broadcast we share offer education. And as I said, we, we do include it and incorporate it into, into uh, people's investment plans and retirement plans where, where clients want us to. But it's, it's a fairly comprehensive service offering. Okay, so that's, that's Jim investments um, and how as a framework we develop a, a kind of a conceptual understanding for public shares so that you know when, when you start looking at these shares on your own um, you you kind of have kind of the right conceptual framework that you are applying um, and then not looking at uh, looking at these as as normal companies like a listed you know pick and pay or Handlers, or, you know, any other kind of relational things. These, these businesses are different, um, or these investments are, are quite different. So I saw this quote on, on Twitter uh, about a, a week ago, or sometime in the week. And it says, um, You don't have to know a man's exact weight to know that he is fat. Um, and that was apparently something Benjamin Graham said. Um, and at the time when I, I read that quote, I was busy thinking about this presentation and how I was going to frame the presentation. And, you know, the reason that quote jumped out at me is because of, if, if I had to bastardize the quote a bit um, and take a bit of liberty, you don't have to know the exact value of a B share to know if it's a buy or not. And, and I'm going to tell you through the rest of the presentation why. But, but that's something I've noticed in my engagement with, with different people over the years um, after writing articles is, is people tell us, what is this thing worth exactly? You know, um, it's why is Kutumanati trading at 120 Rand, which should be trading at 200 Rand a share? Um, because their calculation showed them that it should be trading at 200 Rand a share. Um, so in fact, knowing the exact weight of, or the exact value of some of these shares is actually sometimes not very helpful because you know, a day later that value will change. Um, and hopefully I can, I, can, I can show you why. So, a conceptual understanding of broad-based BE shares. When I, the more I, I think about these shares, because often I'm talking to, to what I would call investment lay people, you know, so people who are professionals in their own right, you know, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're accountants, engineers. But when it comes to investments and broad-based BE shares in particular, they, they are lay people. Um, and often the, the understanding around and, and, and how to think about these shares, uh, as I said earlier, is, is misplaced. And, and thinking about it over the years, most of these people, uh, investors that I talk to, tend to also be uh, buy to let property investors. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that your broad-based BE shares actually have a lot of parallels with buy-to-let property. So if you think about a typical buy-to-let property kind of arrangement, you know, you've got a property which has a value. Let's assume that value is a million rand. Okay, you want to buy this property, you want to let it out, and you're going to make money that way. Very, very um, kind of popular way for, for people to get into to investing. So, so the question is, how do you pay for that property? For the million rand that the property is worth? Well, firstly, most people would negotiate some kind of discount. 
as I've assumed a 5% discount. And more often than not, if you go for a bank loan, the bank requires you to put some of your own money so that they can see that you also have you know, a bit of skin in the game and you have something to lose. So in this example, you know, a little stylized example, yeah, you take 10% of the property value, 100,000 Rand, that's your deposit, and you take a bank loan for 850,000. Add all of that up, and that's the million Rand that you pay for the property. But now you've got a loan that needs to be repaid. So let's assume that that loan seven million a month. So that must be serviced and you are going to charge the tenant a rental income of 7,500 per month. And from that, you will cover the cost of that loan. So, you know, quite a realistic example um, of, of a sort of buy to let scenario. If you look at a broad-based B share structure, the kind of parallels are, are pretty similar. So there's an empowering company wanting to sell a stake of that company to black shareholders, and that percentage of the company that they're selling has, has a value, and that value needs to be paid for. So the shareholders need to to, to find the money to, to pay that value. And so typically you will see there's a discount that, are, that is offered by the seller. The investing public are required to put some of the own money in. That's known as an equity contribution. And there is loan funding that's involved. So there's in the BE share space, uh, you know, there's these sort of fancy and more complex structures called preference shares and vendor finance and notional vendor funding, things like that. But in kind of substance, you know, it's a loan, it's debt funding. And that loan must be repaid as well. And um, your asset your, that you bought pays dividends. And often those dividends are used to repay the loan. Okay, so so you can see that these broad-based B shares are, are a lot similar to a buy-to-let property um, kind of situation. So the question is then, how do you make money from buy-to-let property? So if you look, so if I kind of this is now the full extent of my uh, PowerPoint uh, skill set. Um, I could draw a, a block, and that block represents the value in our example. The property is worth a million. We've taken out a loan of 850,000, and the difference between the property value and the loan is kind of what's called the equity that you have in that property. So if you sell the property, settle the loan, that property is worth of 150,000 to you. But as time moves on, so let's say one year later, the value of the property increases to 1.1 million, so 10% increase, you know, good time in the property market. And because you interest rates are low and you, you're getting more rental income, then you bond, maybe pay a bit more off, and so your loan value a year later is 800,000. Now, when you take 1.1 million, you subtract the 800,000 loan, your equity is, has doubled. So this is why buy-to-let property is such a, uh, a popular way of uh, investing is because, you know, with fairly small moves at the top and the bottom, you kind of get fairly big moves here, um, you know, on the equity side. And if we look seven years later, property continues to go up. So this property that you pay the million rand for is now worth 1.5 million. You've settled about 250,000 rand on the loan. And effectively, your 100,000 rand investment is now, now has a net asset value 
equity value of 900,000. So an 800% return. Okay, so so what you are seeing happening is, is the gearing effects, the effect of borrowing money, buying something worth a lot more than the money that you had. And as that grows, and as a loan is settled, your return on what you invest is, is actually a pretty good uh, what I show here is an extract that I took from the MTM Zakele Futi prospectus. This is a copy and paste from that prospectus. Um, Zakele was selling 9.8 billion rands worth of MTN shares to the public. And this is how it was funded. There was equity contribution from the public. And, you know, those MTN Zakele shareholders could reinvest some of their MTN Zakele shares as their equity contribution. MTN offered a discount of 20%, so it's quite a generous discount. There was third party bank funding and notional vendor finance from MTN. So you can see that the structure that you have here is very similar to the structure of, of a buy to let property. And ultimately, what I'm trying to figure out is, is what is the, the net asset value? You know, what is the price trading at? And is it therefore a buyer? So this is what we're trying to figure out in the kind of B space, is, is, is what, do the, what does this picture look like? And does the share offer value? So before I get into that, into the different shares, yeah, there are just a few concepts that we need to kind of have an understanding of because they are sort of present in the BE space. So there's this concept of net asset value, which I've just explained. So it's just the assets minus the liabilities divided by the number of shares in issue. So net asset value, sometimes referred to as book value, sometimes referred to as intrinsic value, um, it's fairly easy to calculate. So you just subtract the, asset, the liabilities from the assets, and then you compare that value to the value that you see. So you, once you get a, a net asset value per share, you can compare that to the price that that share is trading at, and then make a call about whether that's uh, an attractive investment or not. That book value or that NAV also helps you understand what you might claim should the company dissolve. Now that was quite important because the initial BE structures were set up in such a way that the companies had a kind of a fixed term, five years, seven years, 10 years. And at the end of that period, those companies would dissolve and you would get the shares of the underlying empowering company. Um, that was, was supposed to happen with Cecil and Zala, for example, and uh, Eon Club and Lumisa. You know, at the end of the period, you were going to get these African bank shares and Cecil shares. Things went wrong along the way, but that, that's pretty much why you, an understanding of book value, net asset value was important. The other issue that we need to take cognizance of is this issue of liquidity. And the reason liquidity is important and um, a factor is that your broad-based BE shares generally are illiquid shares. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, if you want to sell your shares generally, you, you would typically have to offer some kind of discount. So liquidity refers to the ability of the asset to be converted into cash. But that second component of liquidity without any price discount being offered is the crucial part. So if you look you know, at money in the bank, money in the bank's liquid because you've got 100,000 rand in the bank and you want your 100,000, you get 100,000 rand out. You don't have to offer the bank a discount to get your money out. If you're trading shares in the JSE, um, they tend to be quite liquid. Sometimes you may have to offer a small discount because you know the share is trading at 100 rand. 
and you want to get out quick, so you sell it at maybe 9950 or 9990 or 9900 a share. So it's a fairly small discount. Uh, but if you're dealing with an illiquid asset like a property, um, it's not uncommon for people to to ask for a 10, 15 percent discount on on properties like that, or on on on, on assets like that in that sort of scenario. So where there's a lack of liquidity, typically you have to be prepared to offer a discount when you're selling. But on the converse side is if you're buying, you typically want to pay some kind of discounted price to what that asset is worth. So the question then becomes, what should that, how big should that liquidity discount be? And I looked at several companies, you know, anywhere between kind of 20 and 30 percent seems to be um, the sort of discount one should offer as a, a liquidity discount um, when we're dealing with an illiquid asset, be that asset a kind of private equity investment or the share or property or anything like that. And then there's a the concept of, of market efficiency. Um, market efficiency really refers to the extent to which available information is reflected in the price of an asset. And typically, uh, markets like the JSE, uh, bond markets, your global markets, those tend to be fairly efficient markets. So if there's any kind of um, development, the prices adjust very quickly. Um, but why market efficiency is important is because it allows you to make sensible choices. So the only way you can get above average profits over time is when there are abnormalities or where you see something that can affect a share, but the market hasn't quite gotten onto that particular piece of information. So over time, you know, index investors will tell you that markets are efficient, so it should not be possible for investors to make above average profits. Uh, but where you have inefficient markets, then generally those offer you an opportunity to make, to make money um, and the excess returns. And, and the BE share space tends to be an inefficient market. It's becoming a lot more efficient and as the market has developed over time, but every now and again, you see pockets of inefficiency, and that presents an opportunity for, for investors to, to then take advantage of that market inefficiency and either buy or sell um, and then make an excess return. And then just very quickly, this concept of secondary trading, because ultimately, any trading you do in, in broad-based BE shares uh, that happens in the secondary market. Um, and these secondary markets could be the JSC, the bond exchange, or some kind of, of over-the-counter platforms. But I'll actually talk about that a bit later, quite specific to the different BE shares. Okay, and then just the last point before I get into the shares is, I think it's important that, that investors know what they are buying. Investors don't always um, <clears throat> know exactly what the underlying asset is in the BE shares that they're buying. So by way of contrast, you've got Sasso Kanyesa, which is invested in a subsidiary of Sasso Limited. So Sasso Kanyesa is invested in Sasso South Africa, and MTN Zakele is invested in the holding company MTN Limited. Um, some of you may recall that Vodacom's initial deal was in Vodacom South Africa and not Vodacom Limited. So when you're trying to price the asset, it's, it's always important to know what you're invested. In fact, you can see with Sasso, they've got Solvi, which is invested at a holding company level, and Kanisa, which is invested at a subsidiary level. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to 
by going to the different shares because I think that's pretty much what people are interested in. And the way I framed it this time is just to draw linkages back to that conceptual framework of, of buy to let um, to, to kind of give you a sense of, of how to think about these shares. So, so the first one I want to look at is Kutumanati, um, pretty much the granddaddy of, of public BE shares, one of the most well known, and certainly by far the best performing of, of all of them. Um, it's invested in multi choice South Africa, not the listed multi choice group. So that's very important uh, to, to bear in mind. Uh, debt was settled two years earlier than expected. So multi choice South Africa proved to be a good tenant, paid very good dividends, and um, you know they were growing quite nicely in the early 2000s. And it's a highly cash generative business. So that, that debt was settled quite quickly. It, it pays a dividend yield, a uh, historic yield of about 11.8%. Uh, the share price trading at the upper 140s now, it's paying a dividend of, of 22 rand a share. So it's, it's a fairly attractive dividend yield. When you consider that the, the yield of the market is closer to 3%, <coughs> bond yields are closer to 7% on the short end, and at 10% on the long end. And um, your, your dividends are taxed at, at a flat 20%. So if you are a high income owner, that's, that's quite attractive. Multi, uh, Putumanati now owns 24.6% of multi choice South Africa. The air profit last year was 6.2 billion. So at a 10 PE, which I think is a fairly reasonable uh, PE assumption to make. You get a market value for multi-choice of about 60, 62 billion. So your Putumanati asset, um, roughly 15.3 billion in value. And the share is currently trading at 9.8 billion. You can see well, there's no debt in this scheme. So there's no debt that we need to factor in in our valuation. And if you take a liquidity discount of 30% on 15.3 billion, you arrive at, at roughly 10 billion, just over 10 billion. So with Putumanati trading at 9.8 billion, it's actually trading fairly close to its fair value. So investors would look at this and essentially what you're going to look at is, is this number. Is firstly, some investors are attracted by the fact that there's no debt inside the deal. And some investors may be looking for yield. So they're retired or they're looking to, to kind of fold a portfolio over time. So they're looking at dividend yielding assets that can pump cash into their portfolios that they can reinvest into other shares. So this is, it's, it's a fairly good kind of anchor for a B share portfolio because you get a good cash payment out of it, you get a low risk offering and it's trading close to, to fair value. But some people want a bit more excitement. So then we start looking at something like MTN Sakele Futi, which owns 4.1% of, of the MTN group, MTN Limited. The debt in MTA in Zakele Futi is, is actually a fairly complex uh, notional vendor funding structure. I think there's, there's, there, there was also that preference uh, share structure as well. Total debt uh, value roughly 5.6 billion. You know, MTN didn't pay dividends in the last, I think, three reporting periods in terms of finals. So as a result, um, Zakele Futi didn't have uh, rental income or, or income coming through to settle their debt. So that, that debt number stayed quite high. Um, but with the MTN share price recovering, the, the NAV has, has grown in the last, certainly in the last couple of months. So you're sitting with a net asset value of around 3.6 billion. If we apply a liquidity discount of 30% on that, you're looking at a fair value of around 2.5 billion. 
or roughly 20 rand a share. The market cap, actually, when I put the slide together, the market cap was at 2 million. Um, I think the market cap is now for Sakelia Futi is now closer to the 2.5 billion. So that discount to net asset value of 45%, um, that's narrowed quite substantially, and the discount to fair value has almost disappeared. I think it's, it's sitting at about 10% now. So if we look at Sakele Futi, we've got an asset of 9.2 billion, debt of 5.6, and a net asset value of around 29.50 a share. And it's trading roughly between, the last time I looked at it was about 17, 18 rand a share. Um, so if we apply a discount to that, because of the lack of liquidity, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's still looking reasonably, excuse me, attractive. Um, there are many who believe that the MTN shares in recovery mode and that we should see that MTN share price running all bit longer. Um, there's talk of unbundling uh, some parts of the business, the, the FinTech part of the business, they de-risk the group a bit by managing to get money out of Nigeria. Um, so, so this is, is looking like the value should unlock the air, um, but the debt is expected to stay kind of fairly stubbornly high. So you might find that if, if you pick up stock, if you're entering this position, you may have to give, uh, accept a slightly lower discount than 30%. Um, but if, if MTN does continue to recover, you, you should make your money uh, back uh, on that. Vodacom Evo year two. It owns 6.2% of Vodacom Limited, roughly worth 16.2 billion. And uh, there's debt of 11.6 billion, which includes a deferred tax liability. It's primarily a CG. CGT capital gains tax liability there. So it's got a net asset value of roughly 4.6 billion or 88 rand a share and a fair value of 61 rand a share using a discount of 30% and liquidity discount of 30%. It leaves us with a share price. Well, we currently have a share price. I think it went to 45 rand a share. But when I put the slide together, it was 44 and a share, which was roughly a 29% discount to its fair value and a significant 50% discount to, to net asset value. So Vodacom in, looks, looks interesting on, or oh, year, year two at least, looks interesting from a valuation perspective because you're picking it up at a discount to its fair value and then a quite a wide discount to net asset value. It does pay a dividend, so there's a trickle dividend that's paid to to Yebo Ye to shareholders. Um, so a lot of the dividend they use to to settle the debt, but because Vodacom is a pretty good dividend payer, it's, it's paying a pretty decent dividend. And you know, interest rates came down three percent last year, so the cost of the debt has reduced. So they're settling debt a bit a bit faster. Um, I did an interesting calculation just to see, you know, if, if debt is fully settled and Vodacom stays at the current share price, then Yebo Yet is worth about 307 rand a share, net asset value. Okay, we applied 30% discount to that, it's worth about 200 rand a share. And um, if Vodacom moves to 200 rand a share, so the underlying investment, but you're still sitting with the current debt, then Yebo Year 2 goes to about 213 rand a share in that asset value. Um, so just showing you and just kind of reinforcing that conceptual model of the um, buy to let property scenario where when you make money from, from both the price going up and from the, the settling of debt. So Vodacom Yebo Year 2 certainly looks quite attractive. So well-structured deal, um, you know, 
you get you get the benefits of of the gearing that if the share price goes up no, not by a lot so from 140 to 200 shares it's about a 40 percent move um you could see the net asset value uh, widening quite a bit so Vodacom remind yebo yetu at least remains my my favorite uh, at the moment um, good underlying business good cash flow from the underlying business um, cheap debt and you will get the gearing benefits all the time but remember gearing works both ways so if if you see Vodacom pulling back even 20 percent then this can disappear quite quickly because of the amount of debt in it. So certainly one for the investor that has a Okay, Cecil, Cecil B ordinary shares or known as all the one. This is Cecil's discounted scheme. So one saw the share ranks peri peso with uh, one Cecil ordinary share. So there's the same voting rights and there's the same dividend uh, rights that a SESO ordinary share will have. Okay, this is currently at a discount of roughly 40% um, to um, its long and uh, well to SESO. Um, long term average discount is, is 30%. So that 30% liquidity discount you see in, in a number of different shares. Um, so if you look at the long term discount, Cecil or Solby one would trade at about 30% below the price of Cecil. The higher discount is probably justified at the moment uh, when you think about the, the risk that's in Cecil. Um, but the, the, the thing is, if you want to make the return and benefit from the higher discount, you've got, you kind of have to go in before the discount narrows. Um, and, and that's where you'll make your money. So you need to be a bit patient with this one. Um, so value can unlock from that discount going from 40% back to 30%. Um, but it's a perpetual scheme. So this one doesn't have a wind up date. There's no liquidity event. So because there's no maturity date, you know, you probably have to accept the fact that you'll be holding a discounted asset for, for a long period of time. And um, for your patient investors, uh, that wider discount actually gives, presents you with an opportunity to lock in a serious long-term dividend yield from the share. So uh, I think it was FNB Securities, I read a report yesterday where they said that they felt that Cecil was on a poor dividend yield of about 6, 6.5%. And this was with Cecil trading at about 210 rand a share. Because Sol BE get the same dividend as Cecil, um, if Cecil's on, and if they write and Cecil is on a 6.5 dividend yield, then Sol B is on a 10.5% forward dividend. So um, this bigger discount presents an opportunity for investors to perhaps, you know, secure future income at, at, a, at a fairly decent rate. So currently the market cap's about just under 800 million, but the NAV, the net asset value is, is, is closer to 1.3 billion. So that 40% that discount. But there's no debt in this one as well. So just similar to Kutumanati, to there's no debt in, in Sol B1. Um, so you just got to track the, the, the discount between Cecil and Sol B. And if the discount widens over time, that's a good strategy to, to buy when the discount is wide. Because when Cecil starts paying dividends again, uh, you, you're certainly going to be in the pound seats. Then the, the latest to the party is SAB's Zenzele Kabili. 
Uh, Kabili owns about 4.6 billion worth of ANH shares at the moment. ANH is Anna Houser Bush uh, InBev. Um, so the ANH shares share price has come down since the, the deal was struck. It's debt of 2.9 billion. So you have a net asset value of roughly 42 and a share. A fair value, if you apply a 30% discount to the 42 Rand, you get a fair value for Zenzele Kabili at 30 Rand a share. And this one's trading at a premium to um, net asset value. Um, you will see it's not the only share to be trading at a premium. Um, I'll touch on the others later. But it's sitting at a hefty 138% premium to NAV and a 233% premium fair value. So yeah, there was a lot of excitement around this one. I think a lot of uh, expectation that was built in from the previous Zenzele scheme that I think people kind of assumed that, you know, I remember there was one headline which said if you put a hundred rand into Zenzele, you were getting paid out 77,000 rand um, at the end of the Zenzele scheme. There was a newspaper report, um, which was right. But one of the consequences is that it kind of misplaced, it set the expectations a bit high for Zenzele Kabili. And that people didn't look at the details of Zenzele Kabili and just went in on the, the basis of, of what happened at Zenzele. And what you'll notice is that if you just settle the debt on Zenzele Kabili, you get to roughly 116 rand a share. At the prevailing uh, InBev share price. And if InBev does incredibly well and goes up 110% from where it's currently trading to about 2,000 rand a share, you'll see that the net asset value of Kabili only goes up 79%. Um, so you don't actually benefit from, from the gearing inside, inside the deal. So, so currently what we have here is a share that's worth roughly 42 Rand a share and is trading at 100 Rand. So I think it goes without saying that this is probably one that you, well, it's almost certainly one that you want to, to uh, avoid until that um, valuation, either it catches up with the, the InBev share price going up, so catches up on that level, or it's going to take a long time for the debt to be settled because, you know, COVID has impacted earnings, impacted the ability of the company to pay shares. So this potentially is a much lower burden. So by the time they settle debt, you know, you're not going to want a 16% return if you buy into the 100 a share. So I certainly want to, to kind of avoid for now, it wouldn't be your first choice. Okay, Ukamba One. Ukamba One is is in is in the public space at the moment because there's an offer for the underlying business, Imperial. But with the information that's publicly available, um, yeah, I, I need to declare uh, force majeure on this one. I'm I'm, I'm trying to uh, come up with a valuation. So I will show you my valuation uh, calculations just now, but. A lot of the information that I'm using is, is outdated because it's from the last set of financial results. And there's been meaningful development in, in this particular holding. And there was a circular that was posted and I actually saw the circular, um, well, the announcement or that the circular has been posted in my email at four o'clock this afternoon. So I haven't had a chance to look at that. Um, but, but just to, to say that there is a fairly complex debt structure in place, which, which does make it difficult to estimate the impact of the deal. And it's, we're dealing with outdated information. So this is a slide and evaluation that I'm gonna to have to update once I've had a chance to go through that circular. Um, but, but from my calculations at the moment, let me just walk you through my calculations. 
So there are 17 million uh, imperial shares inside of Kamba One and 5.2 million deferred ordinary shares. So the way Ocumba worked in its initial form was that there were these deferred ordinary shares that unlocked every year. So every year, some of these deferred shares became ordinary shares um, on a tranche basis. And this would go on until 2025. Um, so these are the unencumbered uh, imperial shares. Um, totally unencumbered, but these are the imperial ordinary shares and these are the deferred ordinary shares. The imperial shares at 66 rand a share, which is the offer that's on the table, is worth 1.1 billion. And the um, deferred ordinary shares, they indicated a price of 219 million. And so you get a total value, asset value of 1.3 billion. Because of the fact that the share price has gone up since since last year, since the offer, you would expect that the capital gains would increase. So all I did was I took the estimate for capital gains in 2019, because the share price was, was at a similar level. I think the share price in 2019 was roughly 70 rand share, and the offer is currently at 66. So all I did was just adjust. Uh, the capital gains number there. Um, so your value post the CGT is 1.3 billion. And then remember with Ucumba 1 is made up of Ucumba A and B shares. The A class shares are the listed shares and the B class shares are for imperial staff. So so you've got to take the liabilities for A and B, and that comes up to roughly 700 million, which leaves you with a net asset value for Kamba A and B of 630 million, and you've got to use all the shares in the issue for Kamba 1, which is 37.5 million, which gives you a NAV of 17 Rand a share. And like I said, I can see that I may be wrong because there's a color structure inside the funding, the debt funding, and uh, that's part of the um, the deal structure. So essentially, with with uh, with a color, there's a floor and a ceiling on the value of the imperial shares, and I can't get the details of the floor and the ceiling. So. If you look at 2019 to 2020, you see that color goes to a value of 100 million. And it's because of the big drop in the share price that, that took place over that period. Now with the share price recovering, potentially that color doesn't have that. So I'm hoping those details are all in the circular. So this, this number could be slightly higher, but I don't think it's, it's at 39 Rand where the share price is currently trading. So this could be another one where you've got a share that's trading at a premium to its net asset value. Again, there's a big disclaimer on this one. Um, if I were to quote a, a local politician at Angaz, in Angaz, I don't know um, where this stands, but hopefully once, once I've uh, looked through the circular, I can come back with a with an updated valuation on this one. And then the last one is Ucumba 2. So Ucumba 2, remember Ucumba 2 is a, consists of the D and E shares. And Ucumba 2 owns 8.4% of motors. So there's a value of 1.8 billion. There's debt of about 750 million. I'm not too sure how the, the debt structuring, because remember this was one deal. So if that invested debt structuring, um, if, if Ucumba 2 is impacted by what's happened at Ucumba 1 with Imperial. So there's also a little bit of an asterisk here. Yeah? So you've got an estimated NAV of, of 28 rand a share, or a fair value of 19 a share, and the share price of 30 rand a share. So, so also trading at a 7% premium above 
the net asset value. But a 7% premium can disappear quite quickly. Um, so if, if, if this share price goes up 10%, then suddenly it, it will be at a, at a discount. So that, that, that one doesn't really give me um, any nightmares to the same extent of, as, a, as a Zakele. I'm just cognizant of time, so I'm going to continue. Okay, the last share I want to talk about is, is a share called TIP1. Um, it stands for Transformational Investment something. Uh, my apologies to the guys at TIP1. Excuse me, the TIP1 is, is essentially looking at investing in listed BE shares, but of interest is the fact that they're also looking to, to tap into the unlisted space. So where you've got listed companies that have had BE shares that are, that are not available in the public space, but you can't buy these shares. Um, Invictus BE deal, okay, that one is, is gone. Omnius BE deal. Canisa, you can't buy at the moment. Uh, Exaros deal. And, and then you've got some empowerment endowments that are sitting with, with these shares that may be looking for, for opportunities to, to liquidate some of those shares. So, tip one is an interesting prospect in that it offers you one diversified investment and gives you exposure to a whole number of shares. Um, so if you're somebody starting out and looking to reduce your risk, uh, tip one becomes a very interesting prospect. Um, they're also able to enter into the kind of the kind of corporate finance structures where they taking advantage of the fact that the Putuminati dividend yield is a lot higher than the cost of debt. So looking at creating structures where they can repay the loan for Putuminati shares that they buy with debt, almost re-gear their investment, which would then give you a much higher return from, from that share. So this is an opportunity for investors who are maybe starting out small and to diverse. Um, the Tim Becker Capital was my favorite because it was the one B share that gave you a diversified exposure. Um, with Tim Becker Capital no longer being around, tip one fills that space quite neatly. Okay, so where do you find these shares? Uh, either trading on the JCB board, on the Equity Express platform, or ZARX. Okay, so tip one you'll find on ZARX. On Equity Express, your Fluminati and the two Cumber shares. You'll find another share there that's not a BE share because it's an over the counter platform. So there's BE and non BE shares there. And then the JSEB board where you can get NT and Zakele, Vodacom, Yebu, Yetu, Saudi, One, and Zenzele, Kabidi. So to trade on the JSCB e-board, you need to open a stockbroking account that offers the BE contract. And that will allow you to then trade in those particular shares. Just cognizant of time, so I'm going to start wrapping up. Big picture, don't try and guess the best opportunity. Um, diversify. If you don't have a lot of money, buy tip. Do not invest money that you can't afford to lose or you may need at short notice. These are illiquid shares. So you have to offer discounts to get out, or you may take long to liquidate your position. There are no guarantees. Um, Slaber, Lumisa shareholders will tell you you can lose all your money in this, in, you know, if the deal goes wrong. Gearing means volatility. It means extra return, but you can have big losses as well. Understand your current financial position before you go into these particular shares. Um, if, if you don't have space for illiquid shares, um, rather start small um, and then start with something like a tip and then over time build out into a bigger, uh, into different specific shares. Okay, but I think the message is you can build a quality portfolio 
of fairly dominant companies in the derivative sectors. Okay, I'm not going to go through this, but essentially the Yale Endowment Fund, one of the best performing institutional funds in the US. The, this is an extract from the 2009 report. Is that the long time horizon is well suited to exploiting less uh, illiquid, less efficient markets. That's where they make their excess returns. And if Yale was a BE compliant entity in South Africa, I'm sure they'd have their boots for. Okay, this does not constitute advice, information, and that's our details. Thank you very much. Simon? Craig, appreciate that. Uh, excellent. A, a, two questions around uh, dividends and the like. I mean, in essence, the, the dividends that are going to flow in the future are going to be directly linked to the dividends coming from the the, the, the main company. There will, there will be some debt payoff, but if, if a company doubles their dividend, then that goes up. And if they halve it, it goes down. That's a fair point. There's, there's going to be that relationship between the two. 100%. So that, that, that's like you like your tenant, mm -hmm. you know, COVID hits, they can't afford the full rent, they pay you mm -hmm. less. So there's less money coming in to service the debt. Um, but in good times, you can, there's big demand for the place, you can push the rent up until it meets the point where, where the market clears and you have more money coming in and you can still get and have some for yourself. So yes, 100%. Perfect. And I got to say, I really like that 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 uh, buy to let analogy. Uh, Fumani is asking, uh, is, does Tip One pay dividend? Good question. I don't think so. Uh, they're growing, so I suspect they will be reinvesting a lot of the dividend mm -hmm. to grow out that portfolio. Cool. Uh, for money, I did drop the link into the chat so you can go to their website. They've, they've got a fair bit of detail there. Uh, you didn't touch on the Barlow world. Have you got a highlight overview of that or no comment? Uh, Kulasi is where? Uh, you can't trade it. Okay. So it's, it's, it's a good point. So even <laughs> if I did a valuation, it means nothing. <laughs> that's, that, that's yeah. fair enough. So it, I think... It's a couple of years before it will list on either OTC or JSC, and then and then we can include it. Okay, okay. So it's one of those deals where initially there's essentially a lock-in and, and there's no transaction happening, and then they open it to transacting. 100%. No, no transacting and no dividend because they're trying to settle as much data as, as possible. Yep, fair enough. Uh, folks, then we are spot on time. I'm not seeing any more questions coming through, so I'm going to park it there. Craig Gredage, uh, really appreciate the time. As always, appreciate the insights. Uh, tons to be learned. As I said, I love that analogy with the, 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 the bar to let a ton there. A uh, couple of folks uh, asking around. Adam, I don't see your question. Uh, uh, Sorry, Adam, repost the question. I'll grab it. Uh, a couple of folks are saying, uh, asking around uh, when the video will be available. It'll, it'll be on just one lap, let's say later this evening. Um, questions coming through around the MTN uh, when the scheme reaches maturity in 2024. Uh, does that just then, con you, you, you essentially get the underlying shares? Because I understand the MTN is at group level. Yes, um, I think it may, like Yebo Yetu and Putumanati and Salbi, one become a perpetual scheme. Mm -hmm. um, because if, if, if they mature it, then they would have to do another deal. Um, and I think I must look at the detail again. I can't remember that offhand. But I seem to think that Akele Futi was going to be a perpetual scheme as well. Uh, okay, okay, gotcha. I hear you on that. So, no, no maturity date. So, so, essentially, 2024 would be the end of the funding period, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not the empowerment period. Okay, so then it carries on trading. So, Adam, that answers the first half. Uh, if it were to mature today, MTN at 13290, you can go crunch those numbers. Uh, MTN Z to pay dividends. Um, are they not paying dividends? Nope. Uh, no, they, so they said they wouldn't pay dividends to try after the funding yeah. period. Yeah. yeah. So after the funding period, then investors would start getting dividends at that point. 
Yeah. Question around liquidity. Uh, Craig, and you touched on it a fair bit, but let's quickly go down that rabbit hole because it is important. I mean, I, I, I loved your point there from the, the Yale and Diamond. You know, it, in fact, if if you if you've got time on your side and and you don't need the you know you're not going to have any pressing need for the money liquidity can work in your favor the trick with you know low liquidity and why you take that that discount process is that you are you are oftentimes it's difficult to get out it's difficult to get out at a decent price so you're going to have to take a squeeze or price in something that's the risk of the liquidity you manage that more than anything by saying i've got a decade i've got time on my side Yes. Uh, Wonga, you're asking about investment clubs and tip one. So, so that's the thing, that liquidity, what it allows you to do, mm -hmm. the discount. Okay, so we seem to have a lag, sorry, Simon. No, um, but yeah, the, the liquidity discount allows you to, to get a higher yield over time. Because you don't pay, you know, you don't pay 200 rand a share for Cecil, 125 rand a share for Cecil B1, and you get the same share, the same dividend as Cecil. So when you calculate the yield, you're not getting 6%, you're getting 10%. Mm -hmm. So that's a benefit, but it's something that's a long term phenomenon. So over time, you will do a lot better by having a long term investment horizon. Yeah. Uh, Wonga, you're asking about tip one allowing investment clubs to invest. They trade in an exchange, so it would be uh, as per the exchange requirements. So you'd have to go and, and, and see. But as I said, I did drop the link to the website, so go and have uh, a look there. It's, it's not going to be their decision. It's going to be the, the exchange's decision. Short answer, if the club meets the requirements, I see no reason why not. Um, but you're going to have to go and chat with the exchange there. Uh, and that is it for questions. Uh, we'll leave it there. Craig, really, really Simon, appreciate um, it. They, they, yeah. Okay, cool. So just on stock on um, tip one, you mm -hmm. can buy it through Stockfiller, the app. So if, you're, if your stock fails ah, on Stockfiller, okay. you can buy tip one through there. Cool. Okay. There's a nice piece of insight there. Uh, we are getting some lag, which is making it a little complex, but I'm going to park it there. Uh, Craig Gradich, appreciate the time. Ladies and gents, appreciate your time this evening. Uh, good turnout for, for what is a, a, a great space for, for investors. Uh, but take Craig's point, this is a, you know, you need time on your side to really get the, the, the significant benefits. And there are some significant benefits there. But uh, keep eyes on those uh, discounts because sometimes you're premium. Uh, and then in the case of the example, the SAB, you're probably better off just buying this share. Uh, everyone, have a good evening. Stay safe. Appreciate the time all. Uh, cheers.